Well, thank you, uh, Sally, for your invitation. It's actually a great opportunity for me to uh, put all these slides together to a broad audience. Last night when I was working very hard late, I was thinking, yeah, this is really worthwhile, right? To look at the batteries again and put things into a broader perspective and see uh, where we are right now. After, particularly after about seven, eight years, my group uh, worked on batteries since I joined the Stanford faculty. So I put in the title, What's Possible? This is really a, 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 a you know, a very promising view of the future and, and look at what happened in the past and try to look at what might be happening in the future. Um, I, I look at this at Silicon Valley, right? We are surrounded by information technology. You know, this is, this is the place. So we look at the history, 1947, this big thing right here, the first transistor was invented in, in the Christmas Eve. Uh, until nowadays, looking at Intel's 22 nanometer tri-gate transistor, just in the linear scale, there's about a million times size reduction. If you take the square, or just simple calculation, it's a million times a million. There's a lot of integration happening right there. This is exactly the basis of the revolution to uh, uh, drive to the application we have seen from computers to all these uh, uh, smart devices. Certainly coupled together with internet, so there's a big explosion of information technology you know, uh, generation right there. You know, quietly, if you look at what's happening in the batteries, right? You know, five, six, seven years ago, you don't even think about the batteries problem that much. But let's look at what's happening since the lead acid battery was invented about 160 years ago. Uh, this is a battery with energy density, sp uh, specific energy, one hour per kilogram. It's only 40. And then through the past 20 years, you have seen you know, nickel cadmium batteries come in, nickel metal hydride, and then later lithium ion batteries. So we didn't last several decades, you have been seeing transition from left to right. This is only five times of energy integration. If I use the term of integration similar as uh, electronics, five times of, of uh, energy integration really make a lot of things happen. You know, in the, in the past many decades, we have seen the, you know, the batteries for starting your car. And, and nowadays, you have all this gadget. Now this is going really big transportation, and uh, only five times of energy integration. So you start to ask the question, how much more energy can we pack in for a given size or weight of the batteries? If we can put in a lot more, would we able to generate a new revolution in the technology, mainly in transportation? It can also make the portable electronics might look different in the future. So this is essentially the question, one of the questions we want to ask, how much energy you can put in. Now let's also see another old technology, that's electrical grid. Electrical grid is considered one of the greatest inventions in human history, one of the greatest inventions. So this really ships electricity, ships the energy, you know, by thousands of kilometers to very long distance. But for 100 years, more than 100 years, and the electrical grid only do one uh, function, that's shipping energy. So if you ask the question, can we integrate storage function into the grid to make it perhaps smarter so we can avoid the blackout? We can inter integrate more solar cell and wind electricity into the electrical grid. There are perhaps much more opportunity if we could do that. So two questions right here, more energy, and then how do you put the storage function into the grid? At a, bigger, a very big scale, these are the questions we try to uh, address. So now let's come back to the reality. Now this lithium-ion battery are dominating. You see this cylinder cell right here. This is what uh, Tesla uh, is using to pack 7,000 batteries into the car right, to, to do the electrical transportation. This is how they look at if you cut this cap open, you see the jerry roll. Now a little bit of uh, uh, materials and uh, chemistry right here. Within this jerry roll, you have two metallic foil, and you coat the materials, carbon and the anode, 
Lithium cobalt oxide, for example, the deal can be other lithium metal oxide as well. On the cathode, there's a separator right here. To separate these two electrodes without the shorting, lithium ions move between the two electrodes back and forth during charging, and electrons are moving outside to power your electronic devices. And if electrons and lithiums, they meet at the cathode, that's the high voltage part, that's your uh, discharge process. If they all go to anode, they carry high energy, that's your charging process. Basically, what you want to do is put electrons and lithium ions meet together back and forth many times. That's so-called rechargeable batteries. But there's a lot of issues right there. So you need to uh, make a, a workable batteries. You need to move electrons. If electrons, they don't move, the batteries don't work. You need to move ions in the liquid and also solid. If they don't move, batteries don't work. You need the structure and volume to be stable if there's a moving of lithium back and forth create structural changes. They're not good either. And then there's a so-called interface, solid electrolyte interface on each of these particles. The reaction with the electrolyte, organic electrolyte, produce a cell passivation layer. You want this layer to be stable. If they are not stable, you keep consuming electrolyte. The battery also die very fast. So these four things need to work together very nicely in order to have a nice batteries. So to uh, get everybody you know, in line to know about the batteries parameter, here is a slide. You care about energy density, uh, either per unit volume or per unit weight. So we measure it using watt hour per liter or per kilogram. There's a power, how fast you can pumping out that uh, energy. How fast can you pumping in? That's the watt per uh, weight or per volume. There's a life, cycle life, you know, 500 cycles for your cell phone and laptops, and 3,000 cycles needed for your cars. Calendar life, cell phone, three to five years is enough. For your car, you need it to be uh, over 10 years. Safety is important, temperature performance. Don't overlook at, uh, look cost. Cost is so, so important to make battery technology to work and uh, transportation and also in grid. <coughs> now let's look at the uh, reality. This is the technology now and uh, uh, for uh, uh, transportation and electrical grid and you see what, what exactly do we need. So I don't go into every detail parameter. Let's look at the two most challenging ones. One is uh, how much energy you pack for a given size of the batteries. Measure this using weight, roughly around 200, you know, up and down depending on the batteries you are, you, are, you are doing. And transportation, we would like to have three times more. So if you drive a Tesla car, if you're having that sports car 250 miles, three times more, you get to 750 miles. If you drive a Nissan Leaf, you get 100 miles, three times will give you 300 miles. So that's the uh, type of target you're looking for for the long term in order to have a really broad scale impact. For the electrical grid, connecting with grid, you don't move your battery's energy density. In principle, doesn't matter. But it might matter to come back to affect your cost. And the cost of a dollar kilowatt hour, this keeps changing this number roughly depending on what type of battery you are using. Well, $300, 250 roughly in, in, in that scale also. We want it to be 100, 100 right here. So the cost needs to, to, to cut down. These two parameters are the major one. Uh, certainly we don't uh, overlook the uh, safety. Safety is very, very important as well. So now let's come back to think about what's possible, you know, uh, to find a solution to uh, enable uh, uh, grid, enable transportation. You need high energy, you need low cost. Basically, low cost mainly come from low cost materials. For the high energy battery, you really need to search what can produce the next, next uh, uh, high energy batteries. Let's come back to look at very simple, you know, uh, uh, you know first year uh, uh, general chemistry, right? What, what's about storing energy? storing that electrons. It's about the electricity. So electrons, they have negative charge. And uh, in order to store electrons, you put them together, they don't like each other, they repel. You want to put a lot of them together, what you need is uh, 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 opposite charge, positive charge. So ions carry the opposite charge. For example, lithium, lightweight, 
and produce a high voltage. Put them into this X, this is a host materials. You know, electrons and lithium needs to meet somewhere. So host is the one to let them to meet and also control whether it's high voltage or the low voltage. So in the simplest description, this is all about electrical chemical energy storage. Um, it's electrons, that's exactly what you want. But you need to pay the price having a really heavy guys right here like lithium. This sounds familiar, this is called overhead. And particularly in university, we are very familiar with. This is really called <laughs> overhead. So in order to do useful work, that's the price you pay. So in the past 20 years, this is what we learned. You, you need to have stable host to host electrons and ions. So graphite is for the end of 370 milliamp hour per gram. Lithium manganese oxide, layer structure lithium metal oxide, lithium ion phosphate, more or less 150, 170 milliamp hour per gram. We can do this back and forth. You know, this, this two-dimensional space, two-dimensional space, 3D and 1D, allow ions to come in, electrons to come in, to meet right there without a big structure change or volume expansion. So you can do this a 500 cycle, 1,000 cycles also. But what if I want to put a lot of electrons in? I want three times more energy. I, I want three more times of electrons. You need three more times of lithium ions. So now you put a lot of lithium ion coming in. There are new materials they can do three to 10 X. For example, lithium metal by itself, silicon and tin as anode, and sulfur and oxygen as cathode. They can store a lot of electrons and lithiums. But lithium and electrons coming in start to do something really bad to these materials. They are not stable anymore. These become unstable host. Well, in the, 10 years ago, if you ask people, would well, you want to use those materials for the batteries? The answer is no, because they are not stable. According to our material design principle, they are not stable, they cannot be uh, rechargeable. So, but if you can make these materials to work, this is a plot of energy per unit weight versus different anode, color indicate different cathode right here. This is a theoretical one, only consider active materials weight. For current lithium ion battery technology, you divide this number roughly by half also. That's the real cell energy density you're talking about. So carbon with a lithium cobalt oxide, this is used in your cell phone. So you're talking about roughly getting close to 180, 200 in the reality. Theoretical is about 400 also. Now you want to look at the three times of energy, it's possible. Silicon anode with a sulfur lithium sulfide combination can give you four to five times also or en more energy. And then lithium metal with sulfur lithium with air potentially can give you a lot more. So from the limit, from the mental limit standpoint, from the chemistry standpoint, it is possible. And uh, now uh, and see whether we can make this battery chemistry uh, to work. That's the key question. Now let's look at this in a little bit detail, why this is so hard, right? People keep talking about high energy battery, why this is so hard? Now let's compare left to right in the past 20 years and uh, next generation. Lithium comes in, they like to break the chemical bonding on the right hand side, there's no chemical bonding on the left. So you break the bond and reform the bond, this takes energy, this, uh, this, this uh, a possible a lot of irreversibility build up. And uh, host atoms do not move on the left. Host atoms, they are moving all the time on the right. So once atoms to move structure, they are not stable. They can collapse. And little structure change on the left, complete structure change on the right. Volume change less than 10% on the left, but it's really big on the right, 100% or more. So this really now presents the challenges in atomic bonding scale, individual particle scale, as well as in the whole electrical scale. How do you really make those materials to work? The thinking needs to be changed. So in the past 20, 25 years or so, you have been seen in the material science community and nanomaterials, nanotechnology has come along. You have seen all kinds of nanostructure. Let me just name a few right here. Uh, nanocrystal, nanotubes, graphene, nano wire, you see this branch, kink structure. So there are a lot of new materials generated. What are the real, real key differences right here? It's the following. 
You can control nano, uh, the materials in the nanoscale, the size, the shape. You can put different materials together, spatially co-located. Try to produce, uh, produce a new function. For example, have a structure, and uh, you can assemble them together in a really interesting way. This exactly the capability allows you to think about a new solution for battery technology. If in the past those materials they couldn't work, it is possible nowadays to make them to work. So nanoscience really provide uh, multi-scale materials control. These uh, multi-scale materials control has influence in the relevant electrochemical processes, including affecting electron and ion transport, so, uh, strain and phases, interface and surface, and chemical species, uh, species location, and control the three-dimensional electro. So these are the two sets, uh, the skill set you can use. Try to make new materials to work. Now let, let me come to the detailed examples. Um, I'm going to spend some time talking about high energy batteries, how you can make high energy high capacity silicon anode and the sulfur cathode to work. And then also, how do you enable local stationary storage using uh, new materials and new thinking? Now let me come to the first part of high energy. So, and Silicon Valley, silicon certainly is particularly attractive. You know, silicon is a great semiconductor. Now you started to learn silicon is not only a semiconductor, it's a great host to host a lot of lithium ions. One silicon atom can take 4.4, six carbon, using your cell phone and uh, this graphite carbon, six of them take uh, one lithium. This produces 11 times of the uh, capacity compared to uh, carbon. So why don't we use silicon? But silicon has this problem we mentioned from atomic bounding scale to the uh, particle to the big electro scale. This uh, lithium comes in, break all the silicon-silicon bonding and reform lithium-silicon bonding. Their volume expand very big, 400%, and then a lot of stress build, build up, they break. And, and this breaking is really killing the battery. The first time you charge out your battery, the battery has already died. Basically, that's the conclusion. So how do we avoid the breaking? Can nanotechnology do that? And how do we build stable solid electrolyte interface? If you have expansion, breaking, contraction happening, the interface is moving all the time with electrolyte. There's no stable solid electrolyte interface. And then the batteries also die very fast. These are the two challenges my group tried to overcome in the past seven years. Now the first paper I, I published uh, 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 with a graduate student to really go into the battery research is uh, this silicon nanowire. The, as soon as I learned about uh, silicon uh, anode problem, this become a natural thinking. Why don't we use a, a nanowire shape? We know the film and the big particles, they all break. But the nanowire is small enough, you know, they, they expand, they contract, expand and contract. But their stem, it is small enough, this free volume around this nanowire, they don't break. And then as the first order of thinking, so well, we went in and tried it. it, it works. So you can start to uh, cycle your uh, batteries. And then we start to find out, you know, this chain is really dramatic. This is a single crystal silicon nanowire to start with. You put lithium in, you see this become amorphous. This remain a, a partially crystalline. Eventually the whole thing become amorphous. This big volume expansion happening. What this really confirm a crystalline silicon, silicon becomes amorphous. Lithium comes in, break all the silicon-silicon bonding, reform lithium-silicon bonding. At room temperature, silicon and lithium's mobility is limited. Silicon and silicon cannot reform, become uh, coming back to crystalline phase, so they stay as a, a amorphous phase. And, and through uh, several years of research, uh, working together with uh, a number of very talented graduate students and postdocs, and also uh, with uh, 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 you know, different expertise and a different research group, uh, we figure out uh, uh, problems one by one. For example, if you ask the question, how does silicon expand? Do they go like this isotropically? Or is something uh, uh, very different going on? So we pattern this pillar with round shape with a 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1 direction. As soon as you put lithium and you see something dramatic uh, happening, so 1, 0, 0 becomes the cross shape. The uh, 1, 1, 0 becomes the LF shape. 1, 1, 1 becomes wrong or more or less has gone shape. Thus the expansion is highly anisotropic. 
This has implication in your battery design. If, if you put silicon together, depending on the orientation of, of the crystal structure, the expansion at different direction is different. So you need to think about that in, in, in uh, designing your battery's uh, electrode. And, and it turned out, you know, this expansion all happened along the 110 direction. This has four, so it has four directions. This has two right here, the sidewall. And, and 110 is quite unique. 110 has this crystal structure open channel ready to react with lithium. It goes very fast. That's the expansion direction. This is nicely in collaboration with uh, Professor Bill Nix right here at the Stanford University. You know, a local mechanical expert is to help us to figure out, you know, a, a lot of this expansion uh, phenomenon. And uh, now let's look at the breaking, right? We, we, our intuition tells us if the structure is small, they don't break anymore. So how big, how big is big, they will break. So we pattern different size of pellet, 240, 390. You see 390 is break right here, but 240 does not. So this is, a, for example, breaking picture right there. Pretty much we figure out 300 nanometer is the critical size. Below that, it doesn't break that often. Above that, they break very often. And then you also use different charging speed to charge out your batteries. The faster you charge, this 240 nanometer, the breaking ratio is increased. Now the thinking is, you know, I want my battery to be charged very, very fast. Can I do that? The answer is probably not. If you do it faster, you break your battery's materials. So if you want to go to whatever, like eight minutes, 10 minutes charging for electrical cars, don't, don't try that. So it's pro you probably break your batteries. <clears throat> so this expansion is really interesting. So uh, I, I'm going to uh, skip through this very quickly. But I want to show you is this, uh, uh, you know, volume expansion and isotropic volume expansion has a significant meaning right here. This is a simulation done in Bill Nix group. Is you look at this anisotropic expansion, look at the stress profile. The stress really concentrate between the two expansion direction. That's the tensile stress right there. That's what the breaking point happening exactly. So the breaking doesn't happen in a random position. It happens in a fixed position. So with this, uh, all this understanding, let me show you something fun. We are having now this uh, capability, and it's actually in this uh, building right here, uh, transmission electron microscopy and uh, in situ capability. You basically build a battery cell. You can look at what's happening inside transmission electron microscopy, having atomic scale resolution if you want to go there. So you can mount, for example, a nanowire onto a metallic contact, having the positive electrode right there, insert lithium ion, uh, this nanowire into ionic liquid, charge up your batteries, electron comes in, lithium comes in, you can see them react. You can also put the particle, electrons can jump into this particle, lithium can also jump, also charge up your battery to see what happened. Now let's see something dramatic. This is a silicon nanowire, 200 nanometer scale bar, very small, with a coating, copper, on the surface. Once you start to charge out this battery, you see the volume expansion happen in a very dramatic way, and this copper coating is cracking. And uh, nothing can stop this volume expansion. It's just so strong. There's a lot of driving force making this happening. But nanowire itself, that does not break. They're small enough. And uh, this is uh, another uh, uh, structure using amorphous silicon particle. It turned out to be not only crystalline silicon can store lithium, amorphous can store lithium as well. If you look at how uh, lithium comes into uh, amorphous silicon, this is amorphous particle. You see this crystalline silicon nanowire get lithiated, and this uh, phase boundary right there. Using this type of tool, we started to understand what's happening in these uh, batteries materials. This is very, very cool. It's only in the last couple of years in the material science community, a tool like this was used for the first time to really try to understand what's happening inside the batteries. So I, I know you are just waiting for the moment. You want to see something is uh, uh, broken. Now let me show you something. So without seeing broken, I was talking to my student, I need to see a broken piece of uh, nanoparticles. Otherwise, go back and do more experiments. Here we go. So. Uh, this is 200 nanometer scale, but also this is a big guy, a big particle. Now you see lithium comes in, crystalline silicon interface is shrinking. This is expanded. This particle is struggling 
because this huge stress build up. At some point, it just cannot hold those stress anymore. You start to see uh, uh, it's going to pop open suddenly. Once this is popped open, game over, the batteries die. So now we also find out a nanoparticle for uh, uh, these uh, a critical breaking size is 150 nanometer, nano is 300 nanometer. We know what's the size we are targeting, targeting in order not to have breaking uh, phenomenon. So let me also mention at the Stanford right here, Slack National Lab, we have very unique facility of uh, single chunk X-ray. Uh, in collaboration with Mark Tony, a scientist up here right there, we use uh, in situ x-ray to also look at how the bear is operated. You know, we, we know, uh, you know if you go to hospital, right, you can do x-ray to look at what's happening in, your, in the body. This is x-ray now is for, uh, for, for use to look at the, how bear is operated, how things are, 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 are broken, you know, where do the materials go, and what kind of new phases can form. These provide a lot of information as well. So through a, a, a several years understanding, we started from silicon nanowires, we move on generation two, making core shell wires, having a stable core, amorphous shell, and then try to think about, you have a stable core right there to maintain mechanical support, to keep moving electrons more efficiently, that improve the batteries. We also go to this hollow nanoparticle structure, use the interior surface to relax the strain without breaking. So it's improving, you know, year by year. And then we go to the double wall hole structure, I will tell you why we want to go to double wall. And, and later go to Yorkshire and the silicon hydrogel and then cell healing. Now it's generation seven. And uh, this month we are going to have a generation eight coming out, but I'm not ready to uh, release this yet. Uh, let, me, uh, let me show you what are the remaining critical problems right there. It's actually this uh, solid electrolyte interface. Our understanding has been if you make the particles small, they don't break. So breaking problem is solved. So what about the electrolyte, the solid electrolyte interface? If you have silicon particle, even they don't break, you put lithium in, they expand. They're going to react with the electrolyte, forming this SEI layer, right? If you take lithium out, they shrink. This surface is not stable. This surface coating will be broken. And then you charge it up again, and then you're going to reform this SEI. Later, this becomes too thick. These consume your electrolyte, consume your lithium. Batteries die very fast, even their nanostructure. Hollow structure go through the same expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction process. Batteries also die. You consume electrolyte. So this become a really tough problem for several years until one day we come up with this idea. What about I make a hollow structure? On the surface, I put in this red color coating. Mechanically, very, very strong. So lithium can still come in to react with silicon, the blue color. Now silicon start to think about where do they go? Where they should go, you know, it's towards outside or inside. But outside is so strong, they're constrained. They have no choice. They better go towards inside. So outer surface is never moving, facing the electrolyte. So even though the inside is going crazy, but the outer surface never feel that. That's exactly the idea. We come up and, and, and we started to make this a double wall silicon nanotube. Go through a process, I, I don't need to go into the detail. Eventually what we make is a silicon inside, silicon dioxide outside. These are the hollow double wall nanotubes you see. So this is a really, really beautiful. You look at this, you put lithium in the outer diameter, almost the same, but inner diameter now shrink. Really confirming expansion can go towards inside. So using this type of structure, comparing silicon wires, single wall hollow tube and a double wall hollow tube. After 2000 cycle, you look at the surface, it's beautiful, it's clean. It doesn't decompose much electrolyte, but the other two cases decompose too much. So this confirm double wall tube is stable. This allow us to run 6000 cycle in the half cell. At least prove the material is now is stable. After this study in 2012, I do feel like we finally understand what's the material design principle to make this type of materials to work next generation. Huge capacity, but big structure change and volume expansion. Now how do you make them low cost, right? This is a high cost process using chemical vapor deposition. 
And, and, and this comes to the, our generation five. Silicon nanoparticle can make at a relative low cost compared to the gas phase synthesis. We actually made this a yolk shell structure. This is just like an egg. And then this is the yolk, this is the shell, this empty space right there. This is a beautiful thing in the nanoscience. Now you can make almost anything, any shape, any combination you like through smart synthesis. You can engineer empty space right here exactly right. Lithium comes in, silicon expand, it just exactly fit without cracking your coating. And then the electrolyte they are sitting outside. So they don't see what's going on inside. This is the Yosha structure, silicon nanoparticle with a carb, uh, carbon shell right there. Now let me show you a video to convince you this idea is really working. We have silicon nanowire. This is a Yosha structure with silicon with a carbon shell. You start to charge up these batteries. And then you can see the silicon expansion is happening, filling the empty space. You leave it just exactly right. You know, uh, if you talk to our EE professors right here, you say, I want 10 nanometer silicon oxide. I want 100. They can exactly give you that thickness. Using that type of synthesis, uh, using those uh, silicon oxide as a sacrificial layer, you can engineer this empty space, allow the volume expansion just exactly fit. So using the Yosha structure, we actually can cycle uh, uh, many, many times. And, and then we start to think about what's even lower cost. So, so uh, talking to uh, Professor Jernan Bao right here in chemical engineering, we start to work on uh, using uh, conducting hydrogel and situ polymerization, coating onto the particles, also making it to work very well. Let me skip this. Uh, and the most recently, we start to think about, you know, if there's things breaking, you use big particle, can you do self-healing? And, uh, and it turned out this polymer, self-healing polymers you can use. The certain polymer can form hydrogen bonding right here. If you form the right group, they form hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding can be easily broken, but the chains are moving. They find each other, they self-heal and bond it together. If you have a battery electro, they are broken with the self-healing polymer coating. You can self-heal. It turned out this idea really uh, is really working right now. And, and, and uh, this, uh, uh, certainly I need to uh, acknowledge this uh, now is supported by uh, GSAP, you know, allow us to uh, explore uh, more of this research. Now with the seventh generation of design, we finally feel like, you know, silicon is getting there. Uh, 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 Sally uh, introduced, uh, you know, uh, uh, 2008, uh, Ampere was, was uh, uh, founded. And then uh, Ampere's uh, commercialized silicon and uh, technology. Uh, you will start to see, uh, you know, battery cells on the market. Uh, it's actually already started to ship outside uh, to, uh, you know, to really show this type of material can start to get into the real commercial uh, space. Now let, let me move on to the cathode. So silicon is an anode. Uh, for the cathode, I'm going to move quickly to really show you that's possible to have the next generation of high energy batteries. So in order to have the full battery's energy density to go very high, sulfur is very attractive. Sulfur has this uh, 1700 milliampere per gram capacity, 10 times of lithium cobalt oxide. The voltage is half. So you are talking about energy that can get to five to uh, four to six times of the existing uh, battery technology, very attractive. Sulfur can be charge and discharge right here. This is the voltage versus capacity. You know, once you put lithium into sulfur, they start to form a polysulfide phase soluble in the electrolyte, later become lithium sulfide. Indeed, it's very, very hard. You know, people work on this for a few decades, the sulfur cathode. What are the problem right here? You have lithium, you have sulfur, and sulfur go through this sulfur A molecule, solid, become polysulfide, soluble, and your electrolyte, you're losing material capacity decay very fast. And also volume expansion is also big, 80%. So, uh, uh, and uh, the uh, lithium sulfide species, they are not con that conducting electronically. Eventually, these three things coupled together make a, really make it become a nightmare to deal with. It's so hard to make sulfur to work. Now let's come back and really think about how do we make it to work. So in the past several years, together with Zhenan uh, uh, Bao and Hong Jie Dai, we come up with uh, uh, several generations of design, start to embed sulfur into a mesoporous carbon using graphene capping, using polymer capping. We actually improved the performance quite a bit, but you still see the capacity decay. It's puzzling for a while. 
So, uh, uh, you know, for about two years, you know, I just feel like, you know, it's not possible to solve this problem. So until, you know, uh, we come up with new ideas, you know, research always go like this, particularly for students, you got to understand this. You know, this very exciting period, and it is a plateau right there, sitting right there for half a year and a year, nothing happened. If you just hold on very tight, something great will happen again. So this is exactly the moment. Uh, when Wesley joined in my group, it's, uh, we start to develop this uh, hollow carbon fiber to embed the software inside. Right, software has volume expansion. Let's embed it inside, leave some empty space right there, just like silicon. The expander was inside. They are captured by this hollow carbon fiber, only leak out the polysulfide from two ends. By doing this, we at least can improve the performance uh, quite a bit. Yes, it does, but it still decay. So, uh, and, and then we look at this in detail and see what's happening. And when, once Wesley started to show me this image, this become very clear. This is a software embedded into hollow carbon and transmission electron microscopy. Once you put lithium in, you start to see software kind of like beats up, right? Become a rod. They detach away from the sidewall. Well, it turned out to be sulfur like to red carbon right here, but lithium sulfide is ionic bonding. Sulfur is covalent bonding. That's uh, you know, freshman chemistry, right? The bonding is different. They, they like different stuff. And, and carbon likes sulfur, but carbon doesn't like lithium sulfide. This will come up, and then the polysulfide is so hard to check. And then this uh, sulfur might be detached, lithium sulfide might be detached away from the sidewall. Electron transport becomes hard. Remember, we need electron transport, we need ion transport. If one thing is screwed up, then you are done, so your capacity will decay. So why don't we do this then? is to look at, uh, we can actually confirm this sulfur likes carbon bonding energy is high through our initial simulation. But lithium sulfide, they don't really like it at all. This is confirmed. Then we say, why don't we put in the bifunctional uh, you know, a polymer right there? For example, PVP is a polymer. Having hydrophobic chain with this polar glue right here, this guy must like lithium sulfide. They're all polar. And the surface will like sulfur. So you have both engineer co-located together, beautiful, beautiful things in a nanotechnology. That's what you can, can do. This really solved the problem. Now we put PVP polymer inside and then coated sulfur inside. And after you cycle this, you don't see, before and after, you don't see those uh, bore R phenomena anymore. The belt is, uh, is it's cycle right here, 300 cycle, uh, quite stable. So we finally think we get it uh, uh, using this understanding. And more cool ideas comes in, you know, similar to silicon. Pretty, pretty much we figure out silicon. We, we also want to use the same strategy for sulfur. If you can make this yolk shell structure using titanium oxide coating, polysulfide cannot leak out anymore. Volume can, ex uh, can expand. Uh, right here, without cracking the coating, this is a beautiful sulfur, TiO2, uh, Yosha structure. This run even longer cycle, 1,000 cycle, with close to 70% capacity retention. So with this on and on, so I'm going to skip this. You know, hollow particle also works well. So what I want to say is, for two examples, anode and cathode, through nanomaterials design, it is possible to have next generation of batteries working with high energy density. Silicon and sulfur combination roughly provide you four times of the energy compared to the existing technology. Actually, research doesn't stop right there. You know, and silicon very right here, we are influenced by what industry really need, right? If you ask the question, you want everything low cost, can you make it happen? For example, silicon nanoparticles are not low cost enough. Uh, Nan is a graduate student in the group. Look into this. It turned out rice husk, this waste, has a lot of silicon dioxide in there, already distributed in the nanoscale. 20% of the weight of the rice has, you probably didn't recognize, they are silicon dioxide. If you burn these organics away, you produce beautiful silicon dioxide nanoparticle, reduced by magnesium, low cost metal, becomes silicon nanoparticle. You can generate uh, silicon nano, uh, polar silicon as well. This is a starting material to do scale up synthesis. Let me also show you something fun. You never connect uh, what batteries has something to do with crabs. Uh, you never make that connection, right? So and if you look at the number, we consume a lot of crabs. So crab shell is uh, half a million ton per year as a waste. And, and you look into this uh, crab shell right here. 
to your beautiful biological structure right there. This is a nano channel, 40, 70 nanometer size range. Really you know, beautiful channel inside. You know, uh, embedded this uh, calcium carbonate right there. Using this as a template, remember we made this hollow carbon fiber to embed it sulfur inside. This is a really beautiful template, allow you to do that. So uh, my postdoc, Hong Bing, is having fun to try all kind of crabs, you know, uh, exploring the restaurant right here. In the blue right here, you know, all kind of crabs. So uh, I, I was offering my help as I traveled to China, let me get some hairy crab for you. I, I bet, you know, passing through the custom might become very high if I, I get that. So, but they all have this beautiful nanoscale channel right there, so consistent. So this is good. We have these low, low cost sources for uh, making uh, batteries material as an example to show you. Now let me switch, switch gear a little bit uh, uh, with uh, uh, remaining uh, 10 minutes also. Let me touch upon the grid scale storage. I mentioned you know, grid in the past is only for shipping energy. Now let's uh, put the energy storage function into that. Particularly important for integration of solar and wind into the electricity. So, so there's a different places to predict how big the market can get, how fast it can grow, so it's beautiful. So the challenging right here is actually the cost is uh, too high right now for, 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 for the grid. When you look at other parameters, they're all challenges. But this one is really the, the, the major one. While looking at the existing technology, pump hydro has been the uh, you know, uh, main uh, uh, method for store the, uh, the, the uh, uh, grid electricity. You pump into high elevation uh, for storage and then coming down and then you can come back to the electricity again. And, and, but its efficiency is probably not that high and also uh, it's limited by ge uh, geographic locations. So the strong motivation to explore electrochemical energy storage the conclusion is, so far they're too expensive. And then uh, there's just no enough cycles to look at the whole lifetime, uh, the cost per cycle. It's not enough. So you need something different to do that. So let, let's look at one particular technology. It has been talked about a lot, called redox flow batteries. So the thinking is, how do I scale up the storage? You know, very simple. So, and the idea is, uh, is to use a big tank right here to store liquid. Now your battery electrode, they are not solid anymore. The energy, energy is uh, stored in the redox molecule. When you use your battery, you can flow in through this side during charging and the discharge you flow in, in the opposite side to get out the energy. In principle, this is very low cost because you can make the tank huge. Your batteries can be small. It should be scalable, but let's look at the reality, what's happening. So this is the most popular one. For example, vanadium redox uh, flow. It's still, the cost is still very high if you look at that. It turned out to be this expensive ionic selective membrane right here. This is the one. You only want the ions to go through, not the liquid, not your redox molecules. And then you're pumping two liquid. You wanted this to be thin. A membrane just means if your pressure is not controlled, like they're going to be broken. And uh, they will be uh, leaking out between each other. So that's not good. And uh, this also limited solubility of these redox molecules right there. If the liquid I have to use, the pumps I need to put in, is cost so much money. I want to store as much energy as possible. How do you do that? You want your solubility of redox molecules to be very high, as high as possible. But this is only in the uh, range of one molar also, one to two molar. They don't store that much energy. It turned out to be, you know, your pumping power needs to be high, your tank is big, everything added together is expensive. So uh, about a, a year, so the high cost is the main thing. About a year ago, we started to work on an idea. We call it a semi-flow, semi-liquid battery, semi-flow. We only flow one electrode, the other electrode is solid. So if we use lithium metal, for example, and then you, we, we flow polysulfide liquid. Polysulfide and the additive will react and form a really nice solid membrane right here. So you don't have that problem of you know, crossover. You know, the coulomb efficiency, so-called how many electrons come in, coming in, how many uh, you can go in, you can go out to 98%. So it's pretty good. And also, you, certainly you remove this high cost membrane, not only that, remember through the, our solvable batteries, we find out polysulfide is so painful to deal with. 
<coughs> and polysulfide has very, very high solubility into organic uh, solvent. So the solubility can go up to less than 10 molar. This is a vanadium redox for 1.7. High solubility means a lot of energy you store per liter of the liquid. <coughs> Once energy density goes up, your cost is cut down. If you can go up by five times, assuming other things are the same, you cut down the cost to a one-fifth. So that's the implication of high energy right here. So this turned out to be a, a becoming a really exciting idea to work on. So, and also I need to mention, if you look at this picture, I think that really indicates it makes sense to work on sulfur. This sulfur is the waste as a mountain, you know, uh, piling up and outside. You don't know what to do with that. People probably pay you money to take away the sulfur, so that's a great deal. Use that to make sulfur batteries. Um, eventually, the cost we estimate, just materials cost uh, uh, involving all these components is $45 per kilowatt hour. DOE's target is very challenging, $100 per kilowatt hour. And in these type of uh, semi-flow batteries has a chance to get there from a cost standpoint. So we started to make this. And, and we use uh, the uh, voltage uh, window within here, uh, this capacity range, this remains as liquid so you can flow. So this actually is a turning a uh, disadvantage into advantages. You know, a uh, sulfur battery has been painful for a long time due to the polysulfide dissolution. Now you can, you can use it uh, as your uh, advantage. And, and in this is an example, you put a lithium metal in and then uh, you just put in some liquid and then you have the, uh, 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 you know, uh, polysulfide. Just building a battery is very, very simple. Let me show you a video also uh, to make, uh, you know, uh, Wesley uh, famous right here. This is Wesley. Um, so here we have a flask. Inside we have a lithium anodes. Can you uh, turn on the speaker? I just connect. No? The polysulfide and it's going to light up these red LEDs. Yeah. I plug this in. I'm going to yes. draw up. It's not loud enough. But you get the idea, it's really simple. So you put the liquids in, it forms a cell passivation layer, the battery is built. So this becomes very simple. So we were able to cycle, uh, you know, uh, many times, you know, depending on how you do it, certainly a few thousand times is possible. So I won't go into details of that, just, uh, you just got to uh, trust me that's uh, happening right now. So let me also mention, you know, within the group, uh, 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 you know, in collaboration with uh, Professor Bob Huggins, you know, Bob bring, uh, brought the, uh, our attention to this uh, uh, a very old material now in the new use. It's called Prussian blue. This is the one to uh, dye your gene become blue color in the past. <laughs> it has this beautiful crystal structure of iron and iron or uh, iron and copper. And then link it by the CN ligand right here with open channel. You can insert sodium, potassium. Iron is very fast. An aqueous solution, very low cost, very re reversible. You know, 40,000 cycles is, is possible. This has a possibility, you know, for very, very low cost, high energy efficiency batteries. Let me also mention, after this uh, is, uh, was accomplished, and we start to think about crazy things, right? You have learned about, you know, this uh, lithium ion battery, that's single valent. Lead acid battery involving acid, that's proton, that's also single valent. Can we do divalent, you know, like, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium batteries. You know, it turned out this structure can intercalate all these ions forming all this beautiful charging, discharging curve. Now you have a whole zoo of battery chemistry you can explore beyond just uh, lithium. So this becomes a uh, really interesting open, opening out a lot of opportunities. So now let me summarize my talk. I, I use the example of uh, high energy silicon and sulfur as well as the, uh, you know, the target of low cost material for the grid scale to really show you we have a number of choices right there. These are not the only one. You know, looking around the world, there's a number of uh, batteries chemistry. I believe in the future, in the next five to 10 years, some of this research 
will turn out to be very, very successful to make a very meaningful impact in your electrical transportation and also grid scale storage. Let me uh, end my talk by uh, thanking the whole uh, group of uh, talented uh, graduate students and postdocs. And uh, I'd like to thank the funding from a from variety of, of sources, uh, DOE, the BAT program, and the new uh, you know, energy hub, uh, JC, so for the energy storage. i also like to thank particularly GSAP. I remember in 2005 when I joined the faculty, 2007, pretty much that's the time. My startup package goes down like crazy. You start to think about what do I do? How, what do I do to feed the uh, graduate students, right? You really have a nightmare to uh, wake up in the middle of the night to thinking about how to raise funding. And the, uh, the, the, one of the, the first funded project by GSAP comes in and then I can sleep through the, uh, through the night after that. So <laughs> I really appreciate that. So a Pre-Core uh, Pre Institute for Energy you know, continues to nucleate a new type of thinking ideas you know, in, in a different energy space. So that's really, really healthy mechanism. I appreciate the uh, CFAN support from pre as well. And also certainly, particularly also from uh, King Abdullah University. I also like to uh, thank uh, uh, you know, the collaborators over the years. And it's a, a really amazing process. Once two professors plus two graduate students sitting together, amazing ideas will come out. That's for sure. This happening. Uh, it's happening at Stanford University. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> uh, since uh, Sally Benson uh, uh, had to leave earlier, uh, she asked me to uh, say uh, giving the students the opportunity first to ask questions. And then we will probably move on to the, some of the uh, older students uh, sitting in the front. <laughs> uh, for your lithium polysulfide battery, uh, is your polysulfide electrolyte starting out as like S8 or is it more like a lithium sulfide? We need to start a sulfur and a soluble state. That's a lithium 2S8. Uh, S8 molecule is not soluble and is either electrolyte, so it's a lithium 2S8. Yeah, I was wondering about the cell killing batteries and was wondering what happens as you cycle through uh, with the particle size, if there's a limit in the size, where, whether it goes down or up, and also the dependence of the concentration of, the, of this polymer. Uh, yeah, a good question. So uh, the student was, uh, uh, was asking, and uh, for the different particle size, how big can we go to? So we try to explore bigger and bigger because bigger particles, uh, silicon particles are cheaper, uh, easier to make. So, so far we can explore, you know, in the f five to 10 micron range, let's say uh, from tens of cycle to hundreds of cycle. The smaller it get, uh, the battle of the cycle life. So I think there will be a balance right there. We need to pick the right size, cycle enough, uh, but still cheap enough. So we still try to find, uh, find out the answers for, for the question you're asking. Uh, so the particle, the particle size goes down as you cycle? Is that the particle, big particle will break into smaller one, but hold it together by the self-healing polymer. And then your second question is how much polymer we need? Uh, we also try to answer this as well. This is very, very new data, so we're still uh, in the exploring uh, stage. With the with, um, silica and nanodes, uh, it seems like you started with nanowires and then you went to the yolk shell um, structure. Why did you make that shift? Uh, there's uh, many reasons. Um, so uh, starting from nan nanowires still remain as a really uh, interesting idea. Uh, the reason is, uh, you know, I co-found the Empress. So Empress started to work on wires. I better just back out. So uh, uh, without conflict of interest. So that's the key, key, key reason. No, no other scientific reason. You have some really nice uh, in situ TEM uh, videos of your batteries charging and discharging. Um, I'm just wondering how you deal with <coughs> beam induced damage in those experiments. So when we set up that uh, 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 in situ TEM, uh, you, you see that we intentionally avoid electron being heating onto the uh, organic electrolyte. Um, you see right here, the reason we use this geometry insert 
uh, the wires into the liquid, electron beam only look at this, it doesn't damage this. If you look at the organic electrolyte, bad things happen very fast. But with that saying, we still be careful, even though this is inorganic materials, if you look at this in the high energy, focus the beam, you still induce certain changes right there. This, uh, we can only take care of uh, precaution, try to spread the beam, you know, not to you know, introduce uh, much damage right there. Yeah, that's the only thing I can say. Other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> <laughs>